Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Rogue Wave podcast and live stream the frequency for all things pop culture and the disruptors behind it. We talk comics, movies, TV, and pop culture every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on Facebook.com slash We Are Rogue Matter, YouTube.com slash Rogue Matter, and Twitter.com slash Rogue underscore Matter. We take this finely crafted video and turn it into the greatest podcast known to man every week, launched on all major podcasting apps. Join the movement. Go Rogue, RogueMatter.com. I'm your host, Michael Dolce, as always, joined by my co-host extraordinaire, the lord of the radio himself, Mr. Hassan Godwin. How you doing, sir? Everything is absolutely okay. That's, uh, yes, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, you know, I, you would think that after you seven don't. years of doing this, that I'd have a better reaction to to your, your stoic entries, but I don't. I got nothing. We've got a great show tonight, though. Uh, we have one of the best interviews we've ever done. Is that is that a, is that safe to say? Absolutely. You, I mean, you also had the best setup that I've ever seen for someone. He was ready for this. Yeah. He was yeah, absolutely ready. We have Julian ready. Bailey, um, one of the pivotal actors in the Alfred Molina vehicle, Three Pines. Uh, it is on um, Amazon Prime. Uh, he plays Peter Morrow. It's, uh, he's, he's the focal point um, in episodes five and six. Um, and, and my God, what a rogue journey this guy has been on. I, we, we, he told we us got... a lot of stuff, which was great, but he never told us what happens next after the cliffhanger, which is, you know, a little, well, I was pretty disappointed. We have our rules. Even when we were off the air, he wouldn't tell us. You know, <laughs> well, he said, you got to go read the books and I, and that's where, yeah, that's, that's what I said. Happens. Good day to you, sir. Yeah. We don't read. Good day that's, to you. No I've reading. had enough. <laughs> I've had enough of your, uh, yeah, you kicked him off. You, now. You, we just shut the screen off on him. No, yeah. we got to we got to pre-record our interview uh, earlier today, um, and uh, we will definitely be running that next. We're also gonna dive into a little rogue regal, a little uh, you know what pop culture are we consuming right now? And uh, but first, I want to talk about RogueMatter.com. So RogueMatter.com is your exclusive home to comics, podcasts, and eBooks. It's not stuff you're gonna find, um, you know you know, your, your typical superhero stuff. It's not your typical anything. It's out of the box rogue stuff. Um, some really great titles, uh, like time trader, which is done by me. Um, so it's definitely gotta be great, but there's also some, there's some amazing books up there. Um, until I die, uh, McBride and groom McBride and groom is a horror book, um, about, uh, a, uh, detective private, a PI, uh, agency that deals with uh, some paranormal stuff, but also has a seven foot ogre as its uh, as its co-founder. Uh, Until I Die is an homage to uh, Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack. But what if they were really CIA assassins? Uh, Kingdom of Tundo is a Filipino epic or an epic Filipino um, folklore tale uh, told by just uh, uh, M A. Uh, Del Rosario, uh, you know, he's out of the Philippines. It's unbelievable. There's just so much great stuff. Uh, there's great stuff coming down the pipe, and you can read it all for free for another month or so. So big announcement coming up in February, so consume it now. Um, you will be able to consume most of this stuff again, um, but there's going to be a big launch of the site, a big push, and uh, so check it out. Go to RogueMatter.com. Uh, there's kick-ass podcasts. There's badass babes of entertainment. That you can download for free, and you will continue to be able to. That'll be on all major podcasting apps. Content and Consequences by friend of the show, Jordan Gelber. Um, you know, so much, so much great content. Um, ebooks, Seal of Fire, covers by uh, Hassan Godwin. You definitely want to check all this stuff out. Uh, we've got some major announcements coming. We've got some, some really great stuff happening down the pipe. Uh, we'll have an all-new Rogue Wave podcast. We'll launch season three of this as well. So uh, stay tuned for RogueMatter.com. All right. When we come back... Take a really short 10-second break, and uh, we will have Julian Bailey from Three Pines when we return. Welcome back to the Rogue Wave podcast. Thrilled to be joined by actor Julian Bailey from the hit Amazon Prime show, Three Pines. Julian, how's it going? It's going good, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, happy to have you. I, I got to tell you, um, Hassan and I are big fans of the show. Um, I, I, 
we cover a lot of comic book movies, anything or, that revolve around pop culture. Mm-hmm. Um, to 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 see a um, just a whodunit style show was actually for me personally just like really refreshing. And mm-hmm. um, you know, your character had you know some of the biggest uh, scenes uh, throughout the entire season. So talk to us about talk to us about the Three Pines experience um, and your personal journey uh, to get there. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, well, the Three Pines experience and my journey to get there. Wow. I mean, uh, we could go back to where it all started. I was actually born in Montreal where we shot the show. I mean, of course, we shot in the country as well, about an hour and a half outside of Montreal. But I was born here and moved to Southern California when I was 18 to go to school. Mm -hmm. Then I started my career in the U.S. after I finished school in Chicago, then went back to L.A. and stayed there until pretty much until I I came back here Mm -hmm. uh, for mostly personal reasons. Like my dad was having health issues. So I came back here and uh, yeah, I ended up, um, you know, finding that there was actually some pretty good work here. So I I was going back and forth between here and LA for a few years. And then, uh, and then after what I should say, right before the pandemic started, I came back here because I got an offer on something. I had been in LA for most of 2019 up to that point. Mm -hmm. And I came back here to Montreal and, uh, and yeah, stuff uh, was was good. I had received an offer on something, did that, did another thing. And then the pandemic hit. So I was like, well, I'd probably rather be stuck up here than in L.A. at this point. So I was kind of not sure. really too mad about that because my, <laughs> my apartment here was like a lot nicer. <laughs> I just had more space. Well, I mean, kinda... look at your chair. I mean, that's amazing yeah. right there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm Peace very jealous. Quiet. Yeah, I didn't have this chair at that time, though. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, so I was just kind of chilling here and like figuring stuff out. And it was like it was a relatively calm year as it was for a lot of people in 2020. And then 2021 came around and it was like proven to be a pretty good year for me. And then I got this audition for this show called Three Pines that was based on these novels by Louise Penny. And I mean, I just loved the material right off the bat. So I put down a self tape and then didn't hear anything for a while. And then uh, and then eventually got a call and they wanted to to have me read like, you know, live um, live, you know, on a on a Zoom or whatever, because they weren't bringing people in because of the pandemic and all that. So. So I, I, uh, I did that, read with them, then got a call after, again, another long wait, uh, and they wanted to see me for a different role. So it was Peter Morrow all along. And so the other, the other role came up, and I read for that, also on Zoom, and didn't hear anything. And then a couple weeks went by, and then heard that I was back in the mix for, for Peter Morrow. But in the middle of all that, just to throw this out there, because it's kind of a sort of funny story, is I think before they asked me to uh, read for the for the other role I was about to start a movie here and like the day I was starting the movie I had this long beard and this hair my agent calls when I'm in the makeup chair or the hair and makeup chair and he's like don't cut your hair don't don't cut your beard <laughs> like three pines likes you you're in the mix they love your look so don't change your look and I'm like <laughs> I'm like I'm literally have like scissors at my head right now they're about to chop my hair off so I'm like oh dude just hold up, hold up. I'm up for a show. It's, you know, and uh, so I talked to producers and they were like, oh, that's cool. Like we can, we can work with that. So they kind of, you know, I kind of split the difference. And then as it turns out, they had me mostly take the, be- well, pretty much take the beard off. For I was going to say, months. right. <laughs> yeah. But they wanted me to keep the hair um, long. That's why my hair was, was long. That's pandemic hair right there, you know? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. So, so that, that we was it. We have shot up here right now for anybody yeah. who's watching this on uh, yeah, there YouTube you go. right now. There you go. It's not like my normal style, but. Um, but yeah, with the pandemic, I was like, man, I don't want to like, I don't know. I just figured it was a good excuse to grow it out. And, uh, so yeah, but it was, it was a trip, man. Cause after I had the chemistry read, you know, as, mm-hmm. in so far as you can gauge chemistry over zoom with Anna Tierney, who plays Clara, I, okay. I didn't hear anything for like, and that was like about mid August, 2021. I didn't hear anything for like four or five days, which normally, yeah. I mean, back in the day in LA, you don't hear anything after for like a big thick third That's or fourth it. audition You're, it's dead in the water usually yeah. so then like it was on a thursday tuesday afternoon i get a call from my agent and he's like can i speak to mr peter morrow please and i'm like what i'm like <laughs> i'm like okay hang on one second let me go get him you know and uh yeah i was i was i was pretty pretty you know happy to, to if hear i don't hear from hassan in a couple of days i think he's dead <laughs> <laughs> like i said cops to his yes well that's Probably because I am. <laughs> so, so we've had actually your co-star Sarah Booth was on uh, with us a few weeks ago, yeah. and I asked the same question. But I, but I want I, I ask all the actors who you know made it through the the pandemic, 
um, and, and still was working and, and practicing. Yeah. Do you prefer the Zoom or do you prefer the in-person reads to like read the room? Well, look, no, for, for, for a callback, I, I definitely prefer the room. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would say this though, for a pre-read, yeah. I think I prefer a self-tape. But for, for a callback, when you want to, you know, get a little deeper into the material, I prefer being live in the room for sure. Um, it, it's tricky it with Zoom, man. Sorry? Is that intimidating or no? Zoom? Like, no, being in the room. I, I don't find that it is. I'm pretty used yeah. to that sort of thing. I've, I've been, you know, in the business for quite a while, so I'm kind of used to that sort of scenario that situation i mean it can be i'll say i'll tell you what can be a little intimidating is when you're testing on a show yeah. for studio or for network which i've done a handful of times mm -hmm. mostly back in the day in la and that can be intimidating because let's say you're, you're you're up for a sitcom you're walking into a room but you're but you're let in by the casting director who's like announcing you it's super <laughs> formal and there's like you know, it depends on the setup, but like, for example, at Warner Brothers once, I, I was up for a show and I was like the only guy they, they had brought to that point. They had one other dude in mind who ended up getting the part and they mm -hmm. made an offer to him. But I was like, it was like all on me. The guy beforehand that was cast in the, in the lead already was like, dude, this is yours, man. It's in the bag, man. He's like, it's going to be awesome, dude. And, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I'm just trying to like remember my lines and like, you know, stay in <laughs> character. I'm trying not to think about all that, you know? Yeah. Um, but but no, they walk you in the room and, and, and they're like, ladies and gentlemen, Julian Bailey. And everyone's in a suit. Nobody says anything. And then the head of Warner Brothers stands up and he like shakes your hand. He's like, you're going to do great, kid. And you're like, oh. <laughs> you're like, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was going to read the great. scene. It, yeah, and it's supposed to be funny, uh, which, you know, hopefully it was. But they're all in suits and everyone's, you know, sitting up uh, in their chairs. And that's that's one uh so that can be intimidating. Uh, but the other way they do it is like theater seating. Like at okay. Fox, I remember it was like theater seating and they're all sort of you know, just like four or five rows of, of kind of, you know, uh, graded seating. Yeah. And they're just sitting there and you got to do this, uh, this comedic scene. So it, that, that can be intimidating. But no, I mean, I like going in the room and being there in person. I just the Zoom thing is weird because you got to like gauge chemistry and yet you can't even look at the girl you're reading with because you have to establish your eye line and keep that consistent. Wow. So so yeah. that can be tricky. But, you know, you, you do what you can. You make it work. And, you know, it's the age we're living in right now, I guess. So yeah. <laughs> I would say so. Uh, you say you've been in the business for a long time. I mean, your first uh, film credit is 1991. Your first television credit is 1988. And you are certainly not that old. Uh, so so you might be older than you think. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, but, uh, you're, you know, I checked your bio. You're around our ages. So let's, yeah. we'll, we'll say we'll say you're really super young. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, not to incriminate us, but um, <laughs> no. but so I mean, you you started out at a, at a at a young age. I mean, what was that experience like? Um, you know, being, I mean, yeah, I mean, like a child actor essentially, and 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 yeah. then kind of coming in. Well, you know, I was born into a musical family, so I was sort of groomed to be a musician. My mom was a music teacher in England, and she's from London, and I was just raised, you know, well, really you know, to be cultured and to like learn about art, like all the arts, but music was really the thing because of my mother. And, and, uh, so she was trying to teach me piano, which if you've ever tried to learn something at a young age, when you're already pretty hyperactive from your mother, mm -hmm. that can be tricky because, you know, you feel very comfortable with her. And so you're, you're liable to like, you know, uh, well, I was just say not necessarily sit still. And, uh, so they tried putting me with another teacher and then eventually, I think the classical rigid approach just wasn't for me. And mm -hmm. before I had a chance to like learn Suzuki method or something more intuitive or more just by ear, uh, I met a kid at school who was on a Canadian TV show and I was kind of starstruck because I'd see this guy on TV and I remember thinking to myself, like, I could do that. Like, I could definitely <laughs> do that. I could pull that off. So I asked my parents if I could join this children's theater group in town and they obliged and so i started doing theater and i loved it and i mm -hmm. was learning like the classics i was learning like you know uh shakespeare and you know moliere and you know uh chekhov and things like that at a pretty young age and um and i i really enjoyed it and at some point uh they referred me to a dubbing studio in town that was doing a japanese anime cartoon into english okay and i auditioned for that and i got it and then the dubbing stuff just kind of started I started just getting offers after that. And, and, and around that same time, a casting crew came 
through different schools in the city looking for two kids to cast for the CBC film. Mm -hmm. And that would be that would have been my first film for the CBC when it was a Christmas movie. And I was cast as one of one of the two lead boys in that. And then I also around that same time did a play with the National Theater School of Canada. So it was like the voiceover, the film and the and the theaters just sort of converged like dominoes. And then after that, I deliberately didn't get an agent because I didn't want to I don't know. I, I didn't want to have this abnormal, weird childhood. I actually somehow had the presence of mind to think like if I really start taking off in my career at, at this point in time, like it might interfere with me being able to have a normal childhood. So I was like, I'm just going to do the voiceover stuff. If film stuff comes up, cool. A couple things did, but I never really pursued it hard at that time because I didn't feel like it would be right for me. Then I screwed up my knee at playing basketball when I was 13. And so I was like, OK, ah. this is probably not going to. <laughs> it's not going to be in my future to be an athlete, at least not one that's getting paid for it. And yeah, and then and then I ended up moving to uh, Pasadena, California when I was 18, right after I turned 18 to go to school. So that's a, it's a hard life uh, being an actor because <laughs> yeah. you're, you're really, you know, unless un, until you get that big break. Um, and for some people, it could be several small breaks. But until you until you actually break through, I mean, you are hustling at a day job and then kind of running off to do auditions and things like that. I mean, was that the experience you had or did you kind of, I mean, again, you have a really impressive filmography, so uh, it seems like maybe you, you found some early success, but you know, what, what was it like mentally to go through that? That's a great question. I mean, I'll tell you straight up, like, yeah, it was really difficult, but I think what would have been more difficult for me is, was, you know, having regret or would have been having regrets. Like, mm -hmm. I just knew I had to go in this general direction. I didn't know how everything would work out, but like try to make a long story short, basically, you know, having had pretty easy success early on, uh, I just had a lot of confidence that it would, things would work out somehow. So when I finished school, I was actually invited to do this third year company thing, which was like a privilege, but something in me was like, you need to go to Chicago because an old mentor of mine had been telling me about Chicago theater and this whole, you know, this really cool scene they had out there. And I just had it in my head that Chicago was a place I needed to go to like cut my teeth early on. Mm -hmm. So I got on a Greyhound. I was living in Calabasas, California at the time and at my girlfriend's dad's house and really, really nice spot. And, but it, it just, I wasn't comfortable because I, I couldn't envision myself like playing it safe at that point. I was 20, I guess. And so I got on a Greyhound bus and, and went to Chicago, slept in the Greyhound station the first night. And then the next morning I was walking up the street to try to see what was out there. I probably had all of 30 bucks in my pocket. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, but I just thought, you know, I, I got to do something. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but that, that's what I did. And then this dude saw me walking. He's smoking a cigarette. He beelines across the street to me, throws a cigarette down, stomps it out. And he goes, Hey kid, he goes, you need a job? And I was like, uh, uh, I, yeah, actually, I do, you know? And so he That's gave me That's always dangerous, job. by the way. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was. But he gave me a job um, as a bike messenger in the Loop, if you're familiar with Chicago. Wow, so okay, yeah. Core area. So I was, you know, I didn't have any place to, to stay, but he was like, there's this kid that's working for us who has, uh, he might have, a, you know, some room for you in his place. So it turns out I met that kid and he was like, it's not exactly a uh, paradise island, but it's not exactly the ghetto. Well, it was the ghetto. And uh, <laughs> my room was really just a large closet. There were literally cockroaches climbing on me at night. Dudes from the neighborhood smoking blunts on the windowsill. And I was just like, why did I leave Calabasas to, to come here to do this? Then we got evicted because the, the dude wasn't um, giving the rent money to the landlords. So we got evicted. Then I was basically homeless. And one night I slept by the Chicago River by an impound lot across the, the river, right across from the Doubletree Hotel under a little tree, actually. Mm -hmm. And the next day, I went through Backstage West, found an audition, which I would do, find auditions, go bring my two monologues and audition. And I found an audition for something. And I met the producer who was temping as a secretary in the financial district. And she was like, where are you living right now? And I was like, uh, you know, I'm kind of, you know, sorting that out. <laughs> Paradise Island. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But at that point, that was over. That that ghetto place was over. And uh, and so she introduced me to this guy that like took me in for like two weeks. He was a former heroin addict and uh, he lived in Lincoln Park. And I was like, well, wow, this is a nice part of Chicago. And um, yeah. And, and, and then um, and, and then after that, man, like. Well, my girlfriend at the time ended up breaking up with me and somehow right after she broke up with me, I booked two things in a row and I ended up getting my SAG card, did a movie with Lou Rawls and Judge 
Reinhold um, and uh, John Aston, <laughs> and then she cashed had out my stack card. Yeah, and then and then yeah, Adam's family, and then um, Beverly Hills Cop Judge Judge Reinhold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then um, and then went back, ended up going back to L.A. But I had made a contact with a great uh, theater group in um, Evanston. I know this is kind of not really a long story short. No, anymore, no, no. Look, let, let me tell you right now. Um, you you have the, the best, best story setup. I've ever heard. <laughs> you have the best setup of, of any guest we've ever had. And right now, your 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 rogue journey, uh, this whole thing, that's. You're 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 in first place right now. <laughs> Thanks, well, I'll, I'll just I'll just say this real quick too. When I got back to L.A., uh, I well, I ended up having to sleep in my car for a long time. I was sleeping in my car mostly in Burbank and the Hollywood Hills. Then I met a lady who had who ran a business in West Hollywood, and of course there was no one there at night, so she let me stay there. Ended up staying there for nearly two years. I would have to leave early in the morning before you know start of the business day, and then. Um, yeah, and then and then started doing stand up at the comedy store and was seen by a literary agent who brought me in, and that's when stuff started to to move for me. But there was lots of ebbs and flows, like ups and downs, you know, from that time where there was all this heat on me when I was like in my early to mid twenties, you know, where you feel like the wheels fall off, and then yeah. next thing you know, like you again, you're, you're back, you're kind of back to square one. Like you test on a show like that. I was driving a geo Metro that was white with a green door that eventually wouldn't open. So I'd have to do this like Dukes of Hazard, jump out of the window. <laughs> Seriously. I'd be, I'd go to like a, like a, I ended up getting cast on a lifetime show. Television for women is what they called it back then. And I don't think they call it that anymore. But, um, at the, at the after party, like for the rap party, I pulled up in my geo Metro. I, I don't know why I didn't buy a new car. Ended up leaving that that little weird setup in West Hollywood, moved to Reseda, and I lived next to an insomniac rooster um, who was just waking up, waking everybody up in the neighborhood at like two, three o'clock. He couldn't figure out what time it was, I guess. But, but, uh, but yeah. So I pull up to the rap party, and the valet's trying to open my door. I'm like, no, 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 it doesn't open. Like you gotta. And if I recall too, I had to roll the window down with a wrench because the handle was broken. And I'm like climbing out of the window. People are like, "Weren't you on that show? Didn't you do like 12 episodes?" So I was like, "Yeah, yeah," but I'm trying to, you know, be prudent with my money. Yeah. <laughs> so then my car blew up. I'm saving and- on gas. I'm saving on gas. Yeah, saving you on gas. Yeah, back yeah, in Paradise man. Island. I mean, that you gotta be, you gotta be frugal. No, but for real though, like all, you know, and being Canadian too, and in, in the U.S. on a on a limited work permit, like I wasn't really supposed to like just go get a job at Blockbuster Video or something. Like it had yeah. to be an acting job. So wow. anything I was doing just to survive, I was, you know, you know, had to be like kind of you know, cash jobs or whatever, a little bit here yeah. and there. So I was selling salads and sandwiches out of a, you know, portable cooler for a while too in West Hollywood and Beverly Hills at hair salons. And, um, yeah, man. I mean, and you know, I mean, and when it got really, really rough was probably like summer of 2006. And Wait, I, that's not was... even the really rough part. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 not even close. Not even close, <laughs> man. No, not even close. No, I ended up, dude, honestly, just to put gas in my tank, man, I remember I would, I would like be going, I was in Van Nuys Park going through, you know, trying to find plastic water bottles to, wow. to recycle, to, um, to be able to eat something and put gas in my tank. And this homeless guy one time came up to me. He was like, Hey man, he's like, I feel like God told me to give you this. And he gives me $5. And I was like, wow. But I mean, that that's wow. having had like a certain degree of success already under my belt. So I was really like, everyone's like, go back to Canada. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, man, I've been here since I was 18. Like LA is home for me. And, and I just, I just believed I was supposed to stay. So that's the best I can do to make it short as far as that little <laughs> chapter And then it goes. turns out you go back to Canada and you land one of the biggest roles of your career. <laughs> Dude, yeah. Really weird, right? I mean, really kind of, I guess, poetic in a way. But yeah, but yeah that's kind of how it how it ended up happening, man. It was a trip. So, yeah. Do you want to host a podcast? Hassan, we're both fired, by the way. Like, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what how, I don't know how it happened, but like <laughs> through the course of this interview, uh, this is now Julian's show. <laughs> yeah, sorry, guys. I talked we're too out. much, man. I mean, you know. Yeah, it's, the, it's back to the it's back. Well, to I was the, telling you know, someone recently, like doing more of these interviews lately. I was like, man, th- it's a skill to be able to answer a question like succinctly enough, but get all the information in there. And I'm obviously I'm not even close to being there uh, as far as we figuring prefer that your out. answer. Yeah, but, don't worry about it. man. This is a podcast. So <laughs> I, this yeah. Is... But yeah, you know, no, I appreciate that, though. But yeah, I definitely uh, I'm definitely learning how to be more succinct. But that's basically the story, man. I could t- I could tell you guys like so many stories, man. Seriously, I, 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 look, I'm all yeah. I don't even have, like I said. I don't have to do anything. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, I don't, we're gonna work out a book deal for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. <laughs> Dude, let's let's talk about that. Yeah, I've yeah. um I've had I've had the pleasure of interviewing many many um you know f- famous folks and people you know who've been in movies and, and music especially um the 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 people that give you nothing are the worst interviews um, <laughs> i interviewed a band called gym class heroes i don't know if you're a fan of them at all um i have heard guys. of them yeah i have heard of them yeah, yeah. 
totally great guys, totally great, great band, whatever. But man, I would ask him a question. And it'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, like, what do you, oh, your new album's dropping, you know, what do you, which, you know, what tracks do you think is going to be great? He's like, I like track three. <laughs> and I'd be like, all right, I got uh, nothing. Like, I remember there was one oh, of the, man. literally what is one of those like scratching nails on a chalkboard kind of interviews because I'm trying to like, you know, uh, oh, okay. So, so talk to me, you know, you have a lot of influences or there are a lot of influences on this record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of them. Have right. you guys ever seen the interview with Billy Bob Thornton and his, his band and uh, that Canadian radio host john gomeshi no oh you got to watch it you got to watch billy bob Google thornton that. and uh, i believe his name is J jan gomeshi um but he ended that guy actually ended up getting into some trouble because of some allegations and all that and uh, billy bob pretty, thornton or the or john no no the other dude the host um okay yeah pretty serious stuff actually so he kind of got canceled or whatever but uh but no billy bob thornton and his band i mean you could just see billy bob was like i kind of I didn't really know Billy Bob, but I had met him because a very good friend of mine was working at the label that his band was was signed to. Um, and but if you watch this interview, man, it's kind of hilarious because he doesn't like to 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 have his his musical career diminished mm -hmm. at all by his fame as an actor. Sure, and you can just tell that the way the guy was asking him questions about you know movies and and things of that nature, he was just like boiling under the surface. And at one point. Uh, he he said something that was kind of a bit of a diss against Canada, and he, the, <laughs> Jan Gomez she was like, "So how how do you like Canada? How's it touring in Canada?" And he's like, "Well, he's like, I don't know. He's like, it's kind of like America, um, but not really. He's like, in, in what way do you mean? He's like, well, kind of like kind of like mashed potatoes without the gravy." <laughs> <laughs> that was, I'm probably not doing it justice, but you just got to watch the interview, man. I, I, I'm definitely going to watch that. I think that's amazing. But it's, it's funny you bring up that point, though, because we've had um, the Bacon brothers on, right? So Kevin yeah. Bacon and his brother. And I always make it a point because I'm sitting there like they're on to promote their record. Mm. So I try to get as many musical questions. Like I, I front load the musical questions because I want them to feel as if, you know, they're here. And especially, you know, Kevin Bacon being, you know, the more recognizable Bacon, even though... Okay. Um, his brother is like an Emmy winner too. I mean, he's an Emmy winning composer. I mean, he's got an Im impressive resume as well too, mm -hmm. but obviously people know who Kevin Bacon is. Right. But I always made it sure to be like, you know, equitable with my questions, making sure that, you know, both brothers got to say something. Cause I, you know, I, I would just, yeah, I would hate to have like, I'd hate to have the mashed potatoes without the gravy. <laughs> so, you know. Oh man, that was such a hard diss, but yeah. I mean, I don't want to say I know what he means, but I kind of do know what he means, <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, mashed potatoes are great, man. You know, especially <laughs> exactly. with some cheese in them. But the gravy can be a little fattening, I guess. But I don't know, man. I know what he means somehow. You know, having lived kind of equal parts of my life in both countries. But it, but that's not a diss against Canada. I love Canada. No, Canada's yeah, a lot I of fun. It. Montreal is a fun town. I, I had it really a, is. I had a it, it, yeah, Montreal time. definitely does not qualify for that analogy. No. Like Montreal is not mashed potatoes without the gravy for sure. I would say out of all the cities in Canada, it's 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 the most fun city. I would say. Now, it's funny because my, my mom listens to, the, to my show. She's very good every week. She listens to the show. She critiques us on, too, when, when she thinks he's too harsh on me. But um, we, had, we went out, my wife and I, she wasn't my wife at the time. We went to Montreal in 2011 to go see Pearl Jam. Oh, and nice. uh, we went with a friend of ours. And then the, the minute we stepped foot on, on the ground, some guy in this big white puffy coat comes right up to our friend. And he's like, give me all your money. And we're like, what, what the heck? We're like, holy crap. And it turns out. He turns around, they give each other a big hug. That was his drug dealer. It was it was his drug dealer. It was my friend's drug dealer. And we ended up, he ended up showing us around. So like everyone in Canada is just so nice. He ended up, he's like, oh, he's like, you guys haven't been here before? I'm, I'm taking all the great places. And he did. He, he took us to all, it was his weed dealer. I mean, nothing, you know, we call him drug yeah, dealer, yeah. but you know, whatever. It was nothing, nothing crazy. He, him and his girlfriend took us around all the, the, the best spots in Montreal to go. We had yeah. such a great time. So, so it doesn't matter up, who you are. Canada yeah, yeah. is the nicest place on the planet. He, he, got you guys, he got you guys to give all your money to everyone else. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah. He was, it, it was very, it was, it, was, it was quite the experience. It was definitely quite the experience. It wasn't a yeah. robbery. It was extortion. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, look, I'm telling you. It was extortion. It was, a, it, was a, <laughs> hey, it was a fun week. That was pre-kids. We could do that. Um, yeah. So getting back to three pines for a second too, um, talking about, uh, you know, your character specifically, I remember it's funny that the casting director, you said that you had this look, right? Like you had the look, right? That's what they um, said. Yeah. I remember, um, watching the first two episodes and your presence in the first two episodes, you know, you weren't in a ton of scenes, but every time you were in a scene, there felt like a gravity to it, like a weight to it. Like something is, 
you know, something's going on. And then it, it completely, to me, contrasts uh, the next two episodes where you're the main focal point, your family's the main focal point. Um, or was it episode five and six? I, I forget which yeah, order yeah, it was. But, but, yeah. but when it was your main focal point, um, you're almost kind of like you're this tortured artist in the first two episodes and you give off this like you really do kind of like you know steal the room with that performance but then you get to be kind of goofy and petulant and the complete polar opposite when it's when it shines on like who you are as a family now take take us through that experience because i thought that was the thing that stood out to me well i appreciate that man thank you for picking that up you know you don't know all the time if people are going to pick up little nuances or things that you're doing as an actor or ways that you're approaching the role choices and things like yeah. that but yeah um no, that that's that's true, man. I mean, right off the bat, like you know, people think my character is such a jerk and all this kind of stuff because they see him ah, being you're, this you're sort of insecure. Artist. You're tortured. It's great. Yeah, exa exactly, exactly. Like, come on, get, throw, you know, give a guy a break. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, they they think of him as as this jerk or whatever. My thing has always been like, you know, for one thing, as an actor, to never judge a character, but just to be like, you know understanding of of who this person is um who this person is as a result of you know their conditioning and their upbringing and so forth so i think we get to see a bit more of why he is the way he is particularly in five and six um i don't think that's giving anything away but no um, no but yeah i mean just when you get to see his family and where he's coming from and, and just the the control the kind of dominating presence that like his mother has over him and evidently that his father did too mm -hmm. and just everything that that you know uh did to him and and the, the brokenness if you will of this dude um then i think hopefully people have a little bit more understanding or empathy uh for you know why he is the way that he is um but yeah i mean not, I'm, I'm glad you picked that up and i hope other people you know could could see that you know, he's he's not yeah. really that much of a, a of a jerk. <laughs> no, there was is, but there's a you mentioned point. episode five and six. There's two there's two scenes in particular that I thought were were really amazing was just uh, the one where you're actually fighting with your brother and you kind of like steal, you know, his prized possession and run off. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, that's exactly like, that's what bro like that's I mean, I don't have a brother, but, you know, I have a sister. So, yeah. I mean, you know, there was always there's always that that underlying but it's it's such a childish thing to do but it doesn't yeah. matter how old you are because it's yeah. your it's your sibling that's just what you do like you regress yeah. to these childhood moments i thought that was amazing but then it was very cathartic at the end no spoilers but you know when you're when you're actually kind of reconciling with him as well and and yeah. and it's it, it makes it even more touching and it made it more real yeah yeah thank you no that's uh that's a great observation man i agree um i got the job back it's on i'm back on i'm back on board <laughs> <laughs> good job man um yeah but no i i agree man and uh i think that was you know that was important to show that degree of reconciliation um was important and um yeah i mean one thing i've said about this show you know is that it really deals with a lot of human issues really mm -hmm. human issues so even if someone can't relate necessarily with like growing up in like a lot of privilege um, with really emotionally cold parents, I think in, in other ways we can all relate with the idea of feeling um, not seen, uh, yeah. not heard, um, and in that sense kind of neglected or rejected. Um, I, I don't know anybody who hasn't dealt with that to some degree. Um, yeah. And I think if you haven't yet, yeah, you will at some point. If, you, if you're going for it in life, if you're going to really shoot for the stars, you know, you're going to you're going to get, you're going to take some knocks. And I, I don't think it's a good idea to try to raise kids like with a, with this idea of keeping them in this safe space all the time, because it's just not reality, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so that's one thing that I loved about the show is just how they, they didn't shy away from, from allowing the vulnerability of, of the human condition, if you will, to, to be shown. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I have a young son. And if, if he's telling me half the stories you told me about how you were when you were a kid, I'm going to be terrified <laughs> for him. I'll be terrified for him. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, well, I'll say this too. My, my dad, like, I think he was aware, probably not fully at the yeah. time, but he was aware to a degree of what I was going through. But he had such a crazy childhood and a crazy life that I think he kind of appreciated the fact that I was putting myself more or less in these difficult situations because I think he thought I probably needed it. But every, yeah. once, every once in a while, my mom, who wasn't making a lot of money, I mean, she was like... Uh, teaching piano you know on the yeah. side like, like a few times a week she would she'd send me like a 100 bucks here and there and i would get this check like in the mail right at the right time i'd be like oh thank god like <laughs> i can i can graduate to like you know 
albacore tuna as opposed to like uh whatever the other kind is you know the (laughs) the really watery thin kind (laughs) or i can buy a can opener to actually get into the tuna (laughs) um but yeah man no no it's it's you know yeah yeah you know you do what you can at one point too i was doing parties for kids on the weekend dressed up like pikachu or a teletubby or uh you'd be welcome in my house now (laughs) <laughs> i mean yeah. you welcome before that but i mean i'm telling you my kids would actually be like wow like, great come on in yeah Speak. yeah yeah but i did that for a while and uh you know i got i got stories to to burn on, on that oh from the I, book i, I know yeah, right. I guess, I, no, man. I, I, yeah should be this is, get the audio transcript here and then <laughs> you get it you get it rolling for that yeah i really um, do man thanks <laughs> So real quick, this is, you know, we have our rule. Don't get fired. Uh, you know, don't say anything that, you, that will get you fired. Okay, but uh, what's the future of Three Pines? What's, you know? Well, as far as that, I mean, just like straight up, I can't I can't say because I don't know yet. Like we, we haven't okay. received any official word about two yet. OK. Um, you know, I said to someone the other day, like there's so much in this business that you can't control. But mm-hmm. I really feel like we left it all out there on the floor. You know, like absolutely we, we did everything we could to to bring something that was really like you know, heart and soul. And, um, we, we feel like people responded quite well to it. I mean, we were number one on Amazon in like five countries for about three weeks. Yeah. Then we got bumped by Jack Ryan, which was sort of to be expected. And, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then, um, and then, uh, what what else was I going to say? I think we're still in like the top five or six in most of those countries, Australia, Ireland, the U S Canada, and the UK. Um, so, Based on the numbers, at least relatively early numbers, a couple months in or a month and a half yeah. in, I think it looks pretty good. But, you know, I've tried to learn not to get too high or too low and just to kind of, you know, glide at an even keel because there's so much that's not in my control. So, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, fingers crossed and we're hoping for for a, for a season two. And I think people won't be disappointed by what we bring um, if we do get that green light. But if not, you know, uh, just keep on swinging, keep on trucking and hopefully I uh, have a chance to uh to keep you know doing some cool stuff but i mean you know i'm not gonna lie man i hope we do um yeah yeah well we're so, pulling for you i mean we're you. absolutely pulling for it. i'd love to i would love to see season two um yeah. i you know it, it it ends on a i i call it a sopranos like uh cliffhanger so there yeah you know, it, if it ends if it ended there i would have to make up my own ending kind of thing but yeah but, um you know well dude th- there are like i think 18 or 19 books or something like yeah. that at this point uh, cause uh, the, the latest one just came out like a month ago or something. And Louise was number one on the New York times bestseller list, like right off the bat. So, I mean, there's a lot of material to cover. We covered basically four books in the first yeah. season. So there's a lot of material to cover and like Alfred Molina is just amazing. And, and he's totally behind the project and left bank who produced the crown have been amazing. And, uh, yeah, man. I mean, just like an incredible team of people from like, you know, basically covering the United Kingdom, Canada and the U S like, it's a great uh joint effort and yeah. um yeah we feel really blessed and fortunate man for sure julian bailey three pines i i don't i don't even think i have to ask the question whether or not he uh ca- he qualifies as, as a true rogue i mean holy cow what a what a journey uh yeah. what an amazing story and uh and i'm and we are we are thrilled for your success and we hope Thank uh you, we hope it continues yeah same <laughs> i appreciate it guys thanks so much <laughs> thanks for having me on when we come back more rogue wave podcast Welcome back to the Rogue Wave podcast. I want to thank Julian Bailey. Uh, I mean, what an unbelievable guest he was. Uh, I mean, I, and the funny thing is, he kept saying like, "I've only scratched the surface of what I could tell you." And I, you know, I was almost frightened. I don't want. I, I wanted to hear that that was the surface. That no, was we got to get that guy a book deal. Oh, I, I, <laughs> we got without a doubt. We got to. We got to get him a Rogue Wave book deal. I, That's going to be know. a bestseller. He's, he's got to his publicist right now and be like, yeah. Yo, "This guy needs to write a book." That that <laughs> is. Um, and again, yeah, his resume for stuff. someone who's had that much success. I mean, you look at his resume, he's been on charmed. He's been on, um, you know, NCIS he's been, uh, he was in, um, the hummingbird project. We didn't even get a chance to talk about that where he, you know, um, where he's actually, uh, what is he gets to face off with Jesse Eisenberg? Like, I mean, uh, he's a video game 
a uh, voiceover actor too. So he's, uh, he does far cry five. He's in that he does. He was in dark Phoenix. He got saved uh, by the Phoenix. He was the shuttle, you know, commander in that. I mean, it's got some credits, man. He's, it's not as if, but Holy cow. He, um, he's lived a life. He's lived, he's lived more life than us. Well, maybe me he's definitely lived more life than me. I think you've, you've, you've done a good job of, of living some life there. I think. No comment. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it, some of his stories have surpassed mine, though. Oh, I, I would, will, yeah, I I would easily so. say. <laughs> I would think so, unless unless you've been holding back on me. Um, but well, yeah, but I mean that goes without saying. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway. want to do a little a little uh, segment we call Rogue Regal. I want to I want to credit uh, the genius um, that is me for coming up with this. No, I'm just kidding. This is this is mm. a, this is this is a, a Lord of the Radio vehicle. Well, you should know um, that because you keep saying it wrong, but you know, <laughs> it's regal, it's right? Like regal, 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 regal? Mm -hmm. yes, regal? Like, as in to regale someone. I like it even less now. <laughs> I thought you regal somebody with something. It's an E at the end of it, man. No, you are right. You are actually <laughs> correct. I can't look, I can't knock it. You're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. Okay, I only know this no, because no. so real, real quick, real quick sidebar on this. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, one of the one of the things about having like kids that I'm going through, is, you know, is that you help them with their homework. So you actually start reliving all your old homework things, whatever. And my son's yeah. in first grade, so we're not talking like heavy homework or anything like that. He's not yeah, doing like calculus. Stuff. You're doing but, calculus and stuff. Right. No, but I mean, just little things like, you know, when he asks you, why do you pronounce this word this way? And you're like, I don't know. We just do <laughs> like you just do. And you have to like, oh, wait, no, because there's an E at the end. So I actually even. Yeah, we did Lake and Cake and Jake. Um, he had to read a story with all ache words and and because it has the E at the end. And I had so yeah. And yeah. and here you are regaling us of that I tale. Am. I'm regaling <laughs> you with incorrect <laughs> yeah. grammar is what I'm uh -huh. doing. <laughs> is what I'm doing. So all right. Hassan, tell us the po tell us the uh which which the, which Aaron gave the secret away, of course. Uh, regale us with the uh, pop culture you are consuming right now. I just consumed the uh, first episode, or first technically two episodes of uh, of The Last of Us um, on HBO or HBO Max in my case. Um, and have you? Do you know what The Last of Us is, Michael? So you... I dug in and I did a little uh, research on this, and okay. uh, it is based on a 2013 PlayStation video game. It is indeed. It's, it's a PlayStation Three. The last one of the last games to come out on the PlayStation 3 platform okay. before the debut PlayStation 4, of course. Yeah, cause that's because four follows three. So, uh, it's a, it was a huge hit, it was a you know, it was a runaway hit. It uh, revolutionized the entire uh, you know, the AAA uh, narrative gameplay mm -hmm. um, industry. Um, just recently, two years ago, I think 2019, the the sequel. To the last of us the last of us part two came out to okay. much controversy but we're not talking about that we're talking about the television show that what is was based the on this is that's that's a well that is, that's, a, oh, deep, is that that's like a, a rabbit hole my friend i was gonna say yeah that's another show Analysis? that's a whole yeah um yeah. the we don't really have to worry about it because um the television show uh, is based on is a, is an adaptation of the first game, and according okay. to uh, Neil Druckmann, who is the uh, one of the creators of the of the game, the franchise, and one of the producers of the television show, okay. it is going to closely adapt the first game. The first season is is an adaptation of the first game. There's only two games, and it he said that they don't have any plans to go beyond the adaptation of both those games. So I guess so far there's only going to be two seasons of uh the last of us but you know we i you know it it was a running runaway hit um was one of hbo's like uh it was i think it's the biggest debut of a television show on HBO. well i i have i have some numbers for you actually uh like i said i i dove right in um seasons i'm pretty sure it's gonna get to second biggest hbo debut behind house of the dragon 4.7 million us but i think it's a i think it's the biggest I, I think it's the biggest for like a debut show um for a show that, that you know for a debut franchise because house of the dragon good, oh, good point yeah it's connected to uh to game of thrones yeah um, good uh, point but uh but yeah i mean look that's no small thing because house of the dragon was another runaway hit 
right? Yeah. So, I mean, it was kind of a foregoing conclusion that this game was going to be a big hit. That, excuse me, this TV show was going to be a big hit because the game was a big hit. Even the controversy um, for the second game, in spite of that, the second game was a huge hit. The second game won almost every award and won game of the year and all that other stuff in spite of the, you know, in spite of the, you know, all that anger. Sure. So uh, it's a foregoing conclusion that this, that this TV show was going to be big, but you never know. So, I mean, when it debuted and uh, the the chatter about it so far has been predominantly favorable. And, uh, you know, I watched it. I'm, I usually watch things with a cynical eye whenever something is super popular and everybody seems to love it and all the punditry is, you know, is buzzing about it. I'm always pretty skeptical because sometimes I'm like, eh, it was okay, but I don't know. It's like kind of like an Andor thing. I was like, well, it's yeah, all yeah, right, sure. but, uh, you know, but I mean, look, I really enjoyed it. I think it was a, a, a great first uh, episode, almost like a movie length episode. Oh my they, God. It was an hour and a half. The first one. Yeah. They crammed, they crammed the two first two episodes together. Which yeah. I think was a good idea because we're according to, According to the uh, producers, where they had originally ended the episode mm -hmm. was probably not going to be enough of a hook for people who are kind of uninitiated. Sure. Uh, do you remember uh, back in the day when they used to do, um, if it was a half an hour show, it'd be like an hour long show, um, or if it was like a, a season premiere, they might they might actually do like a mm -hmm. two hour season premiere, like that. So I mean, it's not something that's uncommon. However, in the streaming age, especially for a debut, I really felt I was like, holy crap, they made a movie like they literally made yeah. a movie. I mean, usually with streaming now, they, they'll do like the first two episodes, but it will be two broken episodes like it would be right. episode one and episode two will be available and you can watch it right away. Or, you know, I think when the when when the expanse was released on Amazon, they had the first three episodes to get you hooked right. because I think, you know, that's a good it's a good strategy. Yeah. As I've said, like it's it's very the revolution of Netflix is still with us. The revolution of getting an entire season dropped at once is still with mm -hmm. us. There are logical reasons to going week to week. Yeah. I understand them, um, especially for uh, trending and streaming and all that other stuff that, that's important and having people uh, discuss these things over and over again. But you do have to if you're going to do a week to week with, a, with you know, the, the, our attention spans as to what it is today. Yeah, you definitely do have to uh, to give us enough of a hook, you know. And so usually yeah. the first two, the first three episodes is enough, which is weird because if you're only talking about eight episodes or whatever, although I do think The Last of Us is going a full ten episodes for this season. But if you're only I talking eight episodes and you do the first three, you only have five weeks left to try to trend. Um, or if you do the first two... You the two episodes you only have six weeks left to trend so it's kind of a weird thing where it's still here today gone tomorrow kind of situation but you gotta you you work with what you got uh really good really uh, exceptional uh piece of television i i thought uh very intriguing ending that they had a uh, post-apocalyptic uh 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 dystopian future with uh you know you know, wasteland like uh, aesthetics yeah. of ruined ruined cities and fallen buildings and, and abandoned cars and overgrown shrubbery everywhere. Uh, that always works. And then this is, you know, this is also uh, an entry in the zombie genre. Um, although it's a it's it's got its own serious spin on it because they're not it, technically it, it zombies. Felt, it felt like The Walking Dead meets World War Z. Um Oh, it's definitely it definitely takes its cues from that. No, no, I, look, it has genre. to. I mean, I, you know, that's the thing they were kind of saying. I think the the only thing that sets it apart is just I I really enjoyed the um, the opening, you know, you know, segue into you know introduction into it where they're in 1968 and the guy explains exactly what's going to happen. So it's mm -hmm. not like there's 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 it was very easy which to is, pick up, which is an add on to the show. That's not in the game. That sequence is not in the game. Yeah, because uh, I, I guess that was a very clever way of of ha explaining the situation in narrative, you know, without having a voiceover or some kind sure. of a, some kind of text at the beginning. The uh, a lot of the sequences in the very beginning with uh, Joel's daughter um, was it was added on how she was mm -hmm. at the neighbor's house and you see the neighbor freaking out, right? Um, 
And, and, you know, even though she can't see it, I mean, there's some really good horror cues in it um, that, you know, that if they keep that up, I think it's going to be pretty powerful. It could, it's probably going to rival, there's a very good chance it's going to rival The Walking Dead. In but its, so that was uh, my question to popularity. you. That was my question to you. How do you make something that, I mean, The Walking Dead essentially is was groundbreaking in that it was a TV show zombie movie, mm -hmm. right? Like that's that had never really been Which done. was off of a, a groundbreaking that it was a comic book adaptation of the genre, that too, the zombie yes. genre, right? Yes. So the, the comic book uh, aesthetic was brand new to the genre. And then the adaptation to the television show was also uniquely brand new to the genre because we hadn't had a, a television uh, a, a show for the zombie genre uh, before, you know, it's yeah. usually a series of movies. So yeah, it was it. The Walking Dead just does have uh, kind of a kind of a, a leapfrog, kind of a, a head start on it because it it was it was basically two. Um, two groundbreaking aspects, uh, at, uh, you know, entries into the zombie, uh, you know, phenomenon. But I mean, I think the, if you're, if you're talking about like, where does the, where does the last of us have uh, room to grow on its own to, to mm -hmm. make its own mark? I think a, the, the infected are, you know, that that's a definite uh, new twist on the zombie, um, on the zombie, on zombies, excuse me. And yeah. as as the shows progress, you will see there's various stages of infection, and you know, and each infected stage has its oh, well, own kind I mean, of it's, ability, it's or you know, right? It showed right in the first episode. Some of where... it they have you haven't seen them all yet, though. So, no, no, I know, know, I know, but I mean, I, I mean, I, I think it was very like the, I think the most gripping scene in the in the opening you know pilot episode or whatever was with the kid. Obviously, I thought that was. You know, when they're like, oh, you're going to you're going to get to go play with all the best toys. You're going to have a great life. And it's like, wow, why are they doing that? Oh, OK, I guess they're not taking any chances. Kind of. <laughs> kind yeah, of but what I know. what I mean is that when when you when they get out into the world yeah. to, to try to, you know, you're going to see that, wow, there's not just one kind. You know, there's yeah, there's varying stages of, of, of degradation for the, you know, for people who are infected. And each stage comes with its own kind of gimmicky superpower you know yeah. like uh you know the, the, you know uh, it, uh you know extra human ability okay kind of circumstance and so you know and i'm pretty sure they're gonna you know they're not gonna they're not gonna slouch on the on the horror aesthetic so this it, yeah. they're gonna reveal each one with a with an appropriate uh you know gasp and awe kind of situation that's cool so i think there's there's a very good chance it's going to be able to make its own mark um, the big deal with the game are the two main characters of Joel and Ellie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, of course, you can't really go wrong with Pedro Pascal. Nope. And uh, Bella Ramsey's already got her own uh, little piece of fame from from the, the Game of Thrones uh, uh, television show. So yes. both of them, both of them have some ground. That's who that was. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. She, had, she was such Deanna a uh, scene stealer in game of thrones mm -hmm. so i mean they there's you know there's, well, look, the at, show look who else pretty... they have in there too look who else they have gabriel luna uh who's agents of shield um he's also been mm -hmm. in a bunch of other things as well too but he was ghost rider um and a tour of, i couldn't remember you know it's funny i'm watching the show uh, and i'm like man i recognize this person oh i recognize this person um you know nick offerman's in it as well too um from uh, parks and rec um, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm looking through the cast list right here, but, uh, you know, who actually caught my attention to, were you a big, did you ever watch Silicon Valley on HBO? No, I did not. Oh, I highly recommend it. That is a, that is a recommendation, uh, to, to binge. It no, is an amazing you, you show. You can regale me of that. Uh, in, in I will regal you when, when you, uh, take the time to do it. Um, but, um, <laughs> never fail to sound as ignorant as you really possible. <laughs> I think I worked out really well. Yes, there, though. yes it did. It did work out. Again. I well think done. it works out really well. Uh, Josh Brenner, he was big head in uh, Silicon Valley and I couldn't place him. I'm watching and I'm like, I know this actor. He's the host uh, at the beginning, the opening, mm -hmm. the opening mm -hmm. scenes. And I thought that was pretty cool. And I was like, oh man, what do I know this guy from? Yeah. I have to start doing some digging. Um, both, but both the voice actors from, uh, both the voice actors from the game are actually in the, in the show somewhere. Oh, that's cool. They're, they're in it. They haven't debuted yet, but they're in it. And I think, uh, uh, 
I think uh, the they they also do a podcast for it. They're you know I mean it's a full yes. it's a full rollout for all of this. Um, yeah. So no, I think it, it definitely is now. Um, one of the things uh, as we're watching the trailer over here, Pedro Pascal is like. I mean, what an MVP this guy is, right? I mean, yeah, he's, and what a yeah, week he's, he's having. Living his by best the way. life. He's he's doing his. Uh, he's he's on the top of the world right now. Right. He's he's um, almost in Tom Cruise territory for being like you know a, an entity all to himself, a brand all to himself. He's so this is going to sound that. crazy, Hassan. This is going to sound crazy, but you know he played uh, o o Oberlin Martell in um, Game of Thrones, and that was obviously his big breakout, right? yeah okay right Fair. that was his, that's where or that i mean he was that in the king's men he was in attention right yeah okay what i'll say though is his breakout role for me to where mm -hmm. all of a sudden i i thought he could i thought he's and this is going to sound ridiculous and trust me i, I it does sound ridiculous because it, it wasn't necessarily as the performance that was so great it was maxwell lord in wonder woman 1984 um Wow. He was the only redeemable factor in that entire movie for me where I was, I, he was very magnetic on screen. He was very, he made the, he made the film watchable for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought to myself that he's gotta be a great actor to, to, to pull something together from this crap, <laughs> you know, like, like something I'm watching here. To be able to actually keep me entertained, that there's got to be something here. And I was like, I remember my reaction to it too. I kept thinking, like, who's this guy? Who is this actor? I was like, that's Pedro Pascal. Like, physically, he didn't look like himself from other things. Uh, I mean, you juxtapose Maxwell Lord up against Oberlin Martell, and you know, Oberlin Martell, he was, you know, he was obviously Ober a scene Oberin. stealer. Oberin, Oberin sorry. Um, <laughs> no, that's all right. You can correct me. I correct you all the time when I say Regal. Um, you know, I, I think, um, when he, when in, in game of Thrones, he, um, I feel like he could have receded to the background just as easily after game of Thrones was over and we would never have seen him ever again. And mm. I would have been like, okay, he was that guy from game of Thrones that I really liked for a couple episodes. Right. Um, seeing him as Maxwell Lord and I'm like, and then he ended up doing that Nicholas Cage movie too. where I think he's, he's excellent in that. And now seeing him in this too, where again, he completely transforms into, uh, his character and, and, it, and it just he has a completely different presence in this show. I mean, it just shows you like how versatile he is and how much range he has. And, you know, Mandalorian doesn't do him justice because he's behind that costume. And it's not even him in the costume, obviously. Right. Not to where. Right. To where, uh, you know, he's the head of Mandalorian. That's great. But really, the suit is the is the main draw, not him. Whereas you get to see him in these other films and, and other TV series and you're like, okay, no, that guy, like that guy's good. Like he's good. Uh, like really good. So that's, that was my take, but he's also having the best week ever, right? Mandalorian season three just dropped its trailer. Yeah. What, what was your, uh, what was your impression? I mean, I think it, I think it looks great. I mean, I'm glad that it's, we got a date, we got a release date, like it's in March. So it's not very far away. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's been over. I mean, he wasn't. We didn't see the Mandalorian last year at all, yeah. except for in the Book of Boba Fett, and that was at the beginning of last year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's been. We haven't seen the Mandalorian since 2021. Yeah, and so I'm looking forward to the story going on, and you know, some more some more adventures with him. Uh, so yeah, it looks it looks great. I mean, look. I don't I don't mean this in a negative way. It does look mm -hmm. like more of the same. It does look like one Mandalorian wandering around with Grogu. Um, and you know, you know, Grief Karga and all the other characters, but who yeah. cares, man? It's more it's more of something pretty awesome. So I'm looking forward to, you know, whatever shenanigans he's gonna get up to. I know he's uh he's on a redemption trail sure. in season three. So we will see uh, exactly exactly what that entails. Um and then we'll wait another Look 10 years for, for season there. four. Look at that oh, green yeah. little cash cow. We're playing the trailer for all our listening uh, audience there. Um, here, here's the funny thing uh, for me, and, it's, and, and I know it's the nostalgia beat, uh, but it's, it's a pretty impressive nostalgia beat. I, it just doesn't matter what it is. When you put together a Star Wars trailer for me, I'm eight years old. I don't know how it happens. 
I don't know how it like I remember watching. So I was watching the football game, which was a it was an abysmal football game, unless you were interested in watching a kicker miss four extra points in a row. And then that became the drama because you just didn't know if the kicker was going to come back out again. And if they were going to let him keep kicking, he got the fifth one, by the way, they scored a fifth touchdown and he got the fifth extra point. That's not why you guys are listening here, but just a little, little side note for you. It, it comes on at halftime and it just shows and immediately goes up and immediately I'm like, <gasps> like, <laughs> I, I can't, there's, there, there's just like, it's like smile just, just it goes on my face no matter what. Um, it also helps that we know Mandalorian's good and respectful to the, to the lineage of star Wars. Yeah. And, so far. Well, so, so far. far, but I mean, that's what I'm saying. We, we know from the past that it's good. So there's no negativity. I have no negativity toward, um, you know, any new Mandalorian stuff. And, and again, it just, it just makes me, it trans, it transforms me back, uh, ironically to 1987 when I was eight years old. So, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing like, greater than than that feeling uh, and i still get that every time i see a trailer so that was my that was my reaction to it um i also like the little um you know you're you're a, you're a star wars nerd so you know all the characters names uh the little the little annoying thing that sat on job of the hut salacious crumb look at that i see you're like a wikipedia you're like a walking star wars wikipedia page i love this like i, I you know not really no I but i mean yeah we <laughs> We need to have, you know what? This is this is a call. No, we call. don't. It's a call to arms here. I need to find another Star Wars nerd, and we need to pit you against him. And and, and but, a, they, a, you know they can they can they can gladly take the crown. That's not really a something that's feverish test of Star Wars knowledge. No, you're see you shrug it off, Hassan. But there's the inner competitor in you. You you'll you're going to win that game. You're going to try to win that. You're not going to look. I would, you. I, you, look, I wouldn't. I would not try to win. But I'm, that's you what know. I'm saying. It's not. It's not a crown that's enviable. Let's just say. Are you <laughs> kidding? Are you kidding me? It is absolutely. It is absolutely. No, no. I'm telling you. I've lived with the 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 knowledge for quite a while, and it has re it has rewarded me very little. So. Yeah, I know. No, look, we were born in the wrong decade in terms of like street cred. You know, like street cred back. You know, when we were kids, was like if you could hit a ball really far or throw a ball really far or, yeah, you know, we don't. It's now it's nothing. We just do not live in a meritocracy, no matter what. So I mean, it's all over. I no, mean, no, no. I don't over. think it has anything to do with that. My point being is like you, if you were super athletic back in the '80s or '90s, like that was usually your crown of fame. Yeah, like that, that was, was your the merit that you got that, because you were able to do something that correct. most people couldn't do. So yeah, right. we. It's there's no meritocracy anymore. Nobody cares what your abilities are, regardless. No, they, they do. Care. They care if your ability is related to comic books, pop culture, and Star nah, Wars. Not really. Not really. I think the problem is there's just so many people that are that are that can now claim to be experts because information is so easily attainable. Right. True. Like you. Very right. You, you could easily be, you know, I was thinking about that the other day, though, too. Like you really had to work hard to know stuff back then, like to know well, to mean, be an yeah, expert in anything. You had to genuinely be passionate. Right. What you're, you know, to know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, you still do to an extent. You can, you can, you could glean a passing knowledge if you're faking it, and then, and that's usually only if you're trying to fake it to a bunch of people who are not knowledgeable in whatever right. you're trying to fake it in. And you could probably, you know, you a good peruse of a Wikipedia page could probably get you through a bunch of layman's uh, in meetings and such to try to pretend that you know the Flash. I know the Flash. You know, I could tell you about Batman, but I mean, if you're actually in the room with a genuine Batman fan, you're you're not going to survive very long. They, right. they will they will tear you to shreds. So, but yeah, we do live in an age where there's a lot of false prophets. I I agree with you, but I don't know. It doesn't seem it's still knowledge of these like niche things doesn't you know that's all you know, it is. It's just wonderful knowledge of of things that are niche. Nobody really you don't get a well, reward for any of it anymore. No, but but I will say this: the one the one saving grace, if you do want to become an expert and be deemed the expert, you know, even though there's a flood of information that's accessible to everybody now, uh, is that uh, this generation has got to be very lazy. Um, <laughs> uh, so you have you have the ability, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. You have the ability to work harder and acquire more knowledge and be more thorough if you choose to, because. Uh, I was reading this article on the Beat website about the sales chart, the diamond sales chart. It's like they don't they don't release it anymore now that all the publishers split 
Um, no one knows now how much comic books are actually selling. Some are suggesting it's because the the big, you know, DC and Marvel don't want to give up that information for either positive reasons or negative reasons. I'm not going to say why, but um, that's that's the speculation on it. Um, but they, they they talked about how um, you know um, there was uh, an article on uh, CBR. Um, uh, the topic has come up in a few places, and so uh, you know, this is uh, comic book resources has kind of gone downhill. Uh, over an agrarious piece called 10 Best Selling DC Comics of All Time Ranked, uh, that only went back a decade. So basically, they didn't, they, they, not the number one book, according to the CBR article, was uh, Batman's 80th anniversary, um, which was D Detective Comics number 1000 and sold 574,000 copies. Now, either the laziness was in not specifying that it was over the past 10 years in the article, or the laziness was that the people who wrote the article just didn't bother to check anything prior to before they were born. That's probably what it was. <laughs> that's most likely so, what it was. There's also, I mean, that's the funny part, too, because I think there's also an article they said, um, oh, yeah, from Screen Rant, which is still up, by the way, the 10 best-selling image comics of all time, which is, again, a great clickbait head headline. Uh, it tops out at King Spawn number one, 2021, 480,000 copies. Now, this might come as a shock to the image founders uh, who regularly sold a million copies or more of their of their books. Uh, Eric Lars, uh, yeah. you know, so. Um, so, yeah. So laziness might prevail uh, if you if you still want to become an expert. Well, I mean, right. nobody. Yeah. Nobody's passionate about anything anymore. I mean, pa being passionate <laughs> is kind of seen as a as a as a an affliction. So, yeah. you know, that's well, the world we live in, unfortunately. All right. What do you guys think? What did you guys think of the last of us comment in the comment section? We'll be happy uh, to uh, discuss that uh, with you uh, over the course of the week. Uh, we appreciate everyone who has joined the live stream tonight. Uh, coming up next week, we've got director Barry J. Uh, he's got a, he's got a pretty impressive um, cast in his new uh, horror film. Uh, that will be coming out, and uh, I'll read the cast to you in, in one second. But it's actually, um, again, like I said, pretty impressive. Uh, from Penny Dreadful, uh, from Riverdale, from um, what's the other show that I saw there? Well, either way, it's very impressive. You should definitely come. Uh, okay, Johnny Beauchamp from Penny Dreadful, uh, Ashley Murray from Riverdale, and Mike Manning from Teen Wolf. Uh, the movie's called The Way Out. So we'll have Barry on to talk to us about it. Uh, it is now out there. Uh, for purchase in digital uh, arenas as well. Uh, and like I said, big stuff coming down the pipe. We appreciate you joining us. We will see everyone next week. Hi guys, Mike Dolce here from the Rogue Wave Podcast. If you like this video, please feel free to like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. It really helps us out. Leave a comment, let us know what you'd like to see in future episodes, and tune in every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, for a brand new episode of the Rogue Wave Podcast.